right. Betsy, oh, I, I have, oh, a, oh, I have okay. a Betsy Arnold, here she is. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to just, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to start off a little bit for those who don't know my story, just very quickly, since I have to stop at 1130. And um, <clears throat> so... My mother developed Alzheimer's in the 90s, and um, they took a trip to Israel and a side trip into Egypt, and she got bacterial pneumonia, and she ran a very high fever for about three days, like 104. And so one of the things we've learned in this process is that a lot of times it's a shock to the system, you know, that, that can, you know, kick this off. And so um, <clears throat> this was like a 93, and in 95, <clears throat> excuse me, she backed out of everything she was doing. Um, you know, she was 69 years old, and I thought, you know, I can, I can understand that. I didn't really think too much about it, and of course, now I understand how young that is, you know, to, to be backing out, but that is one of the early signs is, is withdrawal, withdrawal from activities because they know there's something wrong, and they don't want anyone else to see it, and then in 97, she called my dad crying, which she never did, and, and said she couldn't balance the checkbook, and, and so um, it took a long time to get diagnosed. In the 90s, they generally told you that it was, that you'd had a stroke, and it affected your short-term memory, so that's what we always thought up until um, January of 2001 when we finally got her diagnosed, and so we lived in Houston at the time, and we moved back, <coughs> excuse me, and um, a year later, we moved into my mother's house, and so I was her full-time caregiver, 24 hours a day, <clears throat> seven days a week for the last <clears throat> almost three years, excuse me. And so uh, maybe I need a drink, if you'll get me a drink. And so um, that's why we do what we do. I, I understand where you are and how hard it is because uh, I was 42 years old when I moved home and it's still about kill me. I mean, it was hard and, and um, that's why, you know, I love working with caregivers is because I understand where you are, and I've learned so much more about the disease. You know, when it's your first rodeo, you have no idea what you're doing. You know, n neither did we, and I'm going to stand up here today, and I'm going to give you a lot of information on how you communicate and why, and it's because we made every mistake you can make, and, and it's just, you know, with this disease, it's trial and error, but um, anyway, I'm going to kind of stop it there. So I guess my, my mom died in 04. Um, my dad and I, you know, we started mentoring families, and then, you know, he's like, you know, we want to help people, so we wrote the book, Coach Brawls' Playbook for Alzheimer's Caregivers, and, and I actually went to work for the foundation in 08, and then in 09, I read an article that said less than 10% of caregivers understand how to care for this disease, and that's when I thought to myself, that is so true. No one understands how you care for this. And that's when we, we, you know, we changed from, um, you know, just giving away a playbook to going out and training and doing what we do today. So with that said, I'm going to start here. I'm going to take a drink. All right. Hopefully this cold air is going to kill all the um, um, pollen and everything outside. So I'm going to start with this first quote, and I love it because... It's just a, a great quote, but it says, if you want tomorrow to be better than today, you have to learn something in order to change it. So thank you for coming. I appreciate that, and I hope you learned something today. So I, oh, actually, I'm supposed to be doing this. <laughs> That's my fault. There's the quote. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, the first slide. So now we're actually going to jump into the disease. So what's interesting about this disease is, um, whoops, I went one too far. Okay. I've got to get used to this. I should have practiced. What's interesting about the disease is, is um, they live moment to moment to moment. So if you think about rolling hills like this, when they're on top of the hill, they understand everything going on around them, what they're doing, who they're with, and they're okay with it. You can see it in their eyes. But when they slide down in the valley, you'll see their body language change. You'll see their, their eyes change. And in that moment, you know, they're just not sure where they are, what they're supposed to be doing, who they're with, and they don't like it. So, so that's how they live, moment to moment to moment. Early on, it's more like a plateau, and then it goes down. But as the disease progresses, you know, they live in this moment. And then they live in this moment. And then they live in this moment. So what you do back here in, in that moment determines how this moment is going to be. So one of the things that we learned, too, is um, with my mother, 
is that this is kind of how the how the disease progresses a little bit. If you think of an airplane, you know, it, she, she would kind of clip along like this, and then she would take a dip down. And in that dip, we would notice changes. And my sister Linda, who helped me take care of my mom, she would, you know, we, we'd be like, gosh, look what mom is doing. You know, what does all this mean? But she would always come back up, just not as high as she was. And then she would clip along again, and then she would take another dip. So what's interesting is you have, your, you have three stages, your early your middle stage, and your late stage. And so in the middle stage, if you, take, if you took it from 1 to 10, 1 being early, early, and 10 being, you know, late, you know, headed into the end stage, if you, if you look at, at 5 being the, you know, middle, middle, the second half of the middle stage, you will, you're going to see more changes. The changes are more rapid. There's more dips and more changes through that second half of the stage. So... Um, they live moment to moment to moment. Now, as a disease progresses, their age is regressing. So from a caregiver standpoint, you want to try to figure out where they are in this age regression because it helps you to be able to communicate with them. So you ask yourself, well, how do I do that? Well, if you listen very carefully to things that they say, it will give you insight into where they are. For example, if a husband is looking for his wife and his wife walks in the room and in that moment he's in the valley, he doesn't recognize her, then perhaps he's between maybe age 20 you know, to age 50 because he knows he's married, but he doesn't recognize her because she's gray-headed. So if a mother's looking for her children and her children walk in the room, and in that moment she doesn't recognize them, then perhaps she's in her 20s to early 30s because she's thinking of her children when they're young. And then when they start asking for their mother or they want to go home, then you know they're in their adolescence. So, it's, you know, from a... a, a um, Healthcare professionals. I know we have people in here doing CEUs. So I was in I was in Michigan speaking one time, and they were telling me this story about this gentleman. And he would walk out every day at two o'clock, and he would say, "Horse, horse, horse," and um, and they would be like, "Oh, John, you know what's going on here, you know." And but every day he came out at two o'clock, and he was like, "Horse, horse, horse." So when his wife Ann came in one day, they said, "Ann." You know, John is coming out every day, and he's screaming, horse, horse, horse. And she said, you know, when he was 15, he worked on a horse farm. So they brought in an old saddle and some saddle soap and, and some pictures and like an old bridle. And every day he would get out there and he would clean it because in his mind he was 15 years old. So as a disease progresses, their age is regressing. Okay, so really, there's a lot of confusion. Um, you know, what is dementia? What is Alzheimer's? So really, dementia, am I on the right one? I'm not doing very well on this. I'm sorry. Okay, what is dementia? I went too far. <laughs> okay, I'll let you do it. Okay, thank you. So, um, um, so what is dementia? You know, dementia is a medical word that is used when there are four changes to the brain. The first one is usually short-term memory loss. So they have short-term memory loss, and then ultimately long-term memory loss. The second one is it changes in how people talk. You know, they begin to substitute words, or they can't pull that word down. It changes how people act. You know, 60% of the people are going to wander, or sometimes, you know, they, they will hit you. They will become more agitated. And then the last one is they begin to have trouble doing things like balancing a checkbook. You know, my mother couldn't balance a checkbook anymore. Following a recipe, those are cognitive abilities that we're going to talk about in a minute. So if you think about cancer, cancer is the overall umbrella. Okay, then you've got prostate cancer and breast cancer. Well, dementia is the overall umbrella. And then you've got um, um, vascular dementia, you've got Lewy body dementia, but Alzheimer's is the most common dementia. And then ALS and Parkinson's are all underneath that dementia umbrella. So it's, it's very confusing because I have people come up to me all the time and they'll say, um, I don't think my mom has Alzheimer's, I think she has dementia. But I will give you a layman's way of if you think you have a problem with your loved one, this is something that you can try. I'm going to use, throughout this talk, I'm going to always say her or your mother because my mother was the first one we took care of. And so I'm just going to try to keep it in that tense. But so say you're, if you think you're having issues with your mother, ask her to meet you at 1 o'clock tomorrow at McDonald's. Well, if she meets you at 1 o'clock tomorrow, then you don't have a problem. 
But if tomorrow comes around and she doesn't meet you, but she calls you at 3 and goes, oh, Betsy, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to meet you at McDonald's today at 3 o'clock. Then that can be more like MCI, mild cognitive Im impairment. But if tomorrow comes and she doesn't meet you, and then at 5 o'clock you call her and say, hey, Mom, weren't we going to meet today at 5 o'clock for lunch? And she says, um, you didn't tell me we were going to meet today at lunch. You see, there's a defensiveness in their voice. That means they've completely forgotten it, and that is probably a time when you might want to have her tested. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the next three things is I'm going to talk about, to me, what their main disability is. So their main disability with this disease is short-term memory loss. It seems like an easy concept, but it's not. It's something you have to tell yourself every day for years. I mean, it takes a long time to fully understand this concept because it's foreign to us. It doesn't make sense when you think about the fact that they're never going to remember what you just said is hard. I mean, it's really hard. So I have this caregiver in California, David, that I, I talk to all the time, and, and um, his wife had a lot of issues, but he would always say, so also, here's what makes it hard, okay? When they're on top of the, on top of the hill, okay, they understand what it is you're saying. They can articulate things back to you. They fully understand what it is that you said in that moment, okay? Then it's gone. So you can sit down and say, so this, my friend David, he'd say, well, you know, Joan, I'm going to go to the grocery store. You know, you have some ideas of things I need to get. And she would tell him fully in the moment, understanding everything that he was saying. And so he says, I'll be back in 45 minutes. Then he walks out the door, goes to the grocery store. 15 minutes or so, she looks up and she's like, where's David? Where is he? So she's going to get up and she's going to go look at different places where she would think he would be. So I tell caregivers, especially early in, in the disease, that you can, especially if they can still read, they, that, that you can leave them notes. You know, I've gone to the grocery store, I'll be back in at um, 115. You know, and then I, I say, make five of them. Put one in the kitchen, put one in the bathroom, put one in the bedroom, because what's going to happen is they're going to walk in there, they're going to see it, they're going to pick it up and go, oh, okay, it's at the grocery store, and they're going to throw it away. But then 10 or 15 minutes later, you know, they're going to be like, where's David? So this is what makes it hard, especially with the short-term memory, because they fully understand what it is you're saying in that moment. You know, so you really believe that they, when they do, that they understand it. But then it's just gone. So it's just something that you have to tell yourself all the way through this disease is their disability is short-term memory loss. And as a, again, as a disease progresses, then it can be 30 seconds or a minute. In the, in the earlier stages, you know, they can remember things, you know, up to five or ten minutes. It just depends on where they are and how high-functioning. My father was very high-functioning. My mother lost her ability to read very early, so it was two totally different cases. So, I mean, my dad could count and read up until the time he had a stroke, and he was probably around eight, you know, eight or nine in the middle stage. And so my mother lost the ability to read early in the middle stage, so just two different cases. So I'm going to ask you periodically, what is their disability? Short-term memory loss. Hard to get. Okay, I'm not doing it. He's doing it. Okay. So the second one, the second one that they do is um, they lose their cognitive abilities. So, you know, what is cognition? Cognition has to do with how a person understands and acts in this world. It's their set of abilities, their, their processes that, that are part of nearly every human action. For example, answering a telephone requires four cognitive abilities. Perception. When they hear the phone, can they say, oh, that's the phone ringing, I need to answer it. Uh, the second one is decision making. Do I answer the phone or do I not answer the phone? The third one is motor skills. C can they actually reach down, pick up the phone, and bring it to their ear or walk across the room and answer the phone? And then the fourth one is language. Can they pick up the phone, answer it, understand what the person is saying to them, and articulate something back? So something as easy as answering a telephone requires four cognitive abilities. So as a disease progresses, that's what they're losing, their cognitive abilities. That's why it becomes difficult to do everyday things that they've done their whole life. Get dressed, you know, eat, you know, all those different things. 
And so it's also hard on the caregiver because we don't understand that. You know, it's hard to understand why they can't do the things that they used to do. So the second big thing that, th that happens to them is they lose their cognitive ability. So I love this picture because if you look in the middle of it, it it's, it's denial. You know, there's so much denial that goes into this disease. Um, no one wants to accept their loved one has it. Um, spouses, you know, hide it from spouses or the, the, the two parents hide it from their kids. My mother hid it from everybody. You know, I mean, it's just something that um, is hard to understand. When I started speaking with my dad is when I noticed that he was coming down with it, and it was devastating. You know, I'd look at Molly, and I would say, um, did he just say that? You know, did he just do that? And I would look at her like, oh, my gosh, we are going through this again, and it was devastating. I mean, I, I knew it here, but I could not accept it here. You know, Dr. Linker's a great psychiatrist here in, in Northwest Arkansas, and he had to tell me, Three different times. When we met with my dad, because every time I'd see him, he'd say, you know your dad has Alzheimer's. And I'd go, I know, I know, I know he does. And, but um, really hard to accept your loved ones. So denial is, is just a big part of it. It's just, it's just part of life with, with this disease. So why is taking care of this disease so hard? Well, it's mentally exhausting because, you know, we don't understand the disease. You know, we're trying to understand it, and we're trying to stay one step ahead of them. It's, um, it's physically exhausting. Well, actually, let me skip back to here. It's because you're dealing with someone who's not only losing their memory, but their reasoning, their judgment, and then ultimately their language. And so it's mentally exhausting because you're trying to stay one step ahead of them. It's emotionally exhausting because you're constantly losing a piece of your loved one, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. You know, it's just it's such an emotional disease. And then it's physically exhausting because... When they're resting, you know, you're trying to do laundry or do this or do that. And, and, it's, and my mother got her nights and days turned around. So any of you who are experiencing that, it, is, it can be literally physically exhausting. And so when I talk about reasoning and judgment, so if you think about that process of them moving back in time, you know, like our kids, you know, when, when they're little, we, we say kids are meant to be seen, not heard. And then it's just because you have an opinion doesn't mean you have to state it. You know, so they will say things so far out of the blue that it will just blow your mind. So my dad one time, <laughs> we were at church, and um, he loved the old traditional church. And so this beautiful young lady came in, and, and she sang this beautiful contemporary Christian song. And, and when it was over, everybody clapped, you know, because it was just beautiful. And as soon as it got quiet, my dad goes, boo! I mean, just as loud as he could. And we're just like, oh my gosh, you know, and they're all like, that's Frank Royals up there booing them, you know, and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, and so, um, so it, <laughs> I mean, it's, he did a lot of funny things, believe me, I, I, I could tell you lots of stories, and probably will on him, but so also, too, it's, um, it's uncharted territory, you know, we don't understand it, you know, there's that full range of emotions, there's isolation, there's so much guilt involved in this, because are we doing it right, or are we not doing it right, woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know, all those things that go on, but, you know, one of the hardest things for me was always having to choose, my husband became disabled, during this time when I was taking care of my mother. My, my kids were 12 and 13. You know, I had my dad I was helping take care of, and my mom always won. So always having to choose who you're going to take care of is hard. And then the other thing is just you have such limited time for yourself. So the whole key to this process is you, the caregivers. Their whole day depends on you, how you talk to them, how you look. I mean, your facial expressions and your body language is so important because they're zeroed in on you. You know, you're their life source. You're their voice. You know, they look at everything that you do. Um, so if, you, if they ask you the same thing for, you know, the 13th time and you roll your eyes and you don't even realize you've rolled your eyes, they see that, you know. So one of the things that's interesting, too, is, is when you walk into a room with someone um, and they kind of have a look on, on their face and you're not sure, two of the oldest things that we do, some of the first things we teach our kids is to smile and to wave. 
you know. So if you're ever unsure when you walk in a room, you can walk in there and, you know, like, hey, how are you doing today, you know. Come down on your knee and take their hand and, and okay, did I wave? <laughs> That's a big thing. You know, wave and then come in and take their hand and, you know, isn't it a beautiful day outside today? Because they respond to that because that is so long-term. Waving and smiling is just you know, one of the things that they, they respond to. So i going to move on. Okay, I forgot I'm not doing that. I'm going to set this over here, and then I don't get confused. So one of the things that I want to talk to next is um, I want you to learn the eyes. So this is, your, this is part of your homework, all you caregivers. When you go home today, one of the things I want you to start doing is I want you to learn the eyes because the eyes are your insight into their brain, especially as a disease progresses. So what do I mean by that? Are they happy? You know, when you walk in the room, are they smiling or are they sad? You know, my mother knew there was something wrong with her for a long time. She asked me every day, and she cried. She, I mean, she cried, and I cried. Now, when they're in the valley, you know, you're going to see that confused look, which is going to quickly go to mistrust, and then they'll have a, be a behavioral change. So it's real important when they're in the valley where you see the look of confusion to reassure them. You know, I, I called my mom, Bibi, and I said, well, Bibi, it's Betsy. I'm your daughter, I love you, you're safe, and I'm not going to leave you. Two really big statements to say to women, especially because women tend to be more frightened than men throughout this disease, but there are also looks um, when they're sick. Learn that look, or when they're hurt, you know, that's a different look. It's so interesting because many times as this disease progresses, they lose their ability to, to communicate. They'll talk kind of gibberish. It's hard to understand what it is they're trying to say. So if you learn the eyes, you know, the eyes are your insight into the brain. So no matter what you do throughout this process, the first thing I want you to do is to look at the eyes because that's going to tell you where your loved one is. Are they on top of the hill? Are they down in the valley? Are they sick? You know, so throughout this, I'm going to always say, look at the eyes. What are the eyes telling you? They really are your insight into their brain. So getting started is one of the most difficult things, and I'm just going to kind of touch on this lightly, but it's hard to get started, especially when it's a parent and you know there's something wrong and that you know that they need to be, you know, someone needs to be with them. So I was living in Texas at the time, and my sister Linda, some of the things that she would do is she would um, call my mom and say, hey, mom. My, uh, my washing machine broke. Can I bring my laundry over and do some laundry? And she'd say, sure, you know, not realizing that she was coming over there to keep an eye on her. And then she would say, well, why don't we go to lunch or why don't we do this, you know? So if you, here's the important thing. You know your loved one's likes and dislikes. You know, you know their background. Most people are, are, are generally very kind, and they will do anything to help you or to help someone. So when you're in this process of coming up with things to try to get them to allow you to do to come to their house, think about your loved one and things that they enjoy doing and what's going to work. You know, what can I say to my mom that's going to get her to do what I want her to do? And we're going to talk more about that later. But really, you know, those are things that it's hard to get started because they know there's something wrong and they don't want to be babysat. So coming up with excuses on why you need to come to their house. And really, laundry is a great one. You can use that for several days because, well, you know, can't get them, can't get the repairman out, you know. So, um, but it, it is hard to get started. So now I'm going to go into some communication things because, to me, what we learned in our experience is um, communication is the key to everything. And so um, w w the first one is, you know, to speak calmly and end your sentences in a positive note. Um, I must have said 50,000 times, isn't that great? We're going to have so much fun. No matter what it was I was saying, I would end my sentences that way because even when they don't understand exactly what it is you're saying, if it's positive, they'll go with you. And so, um, you know, so for just a second, I want, um, I want everybody to think that, so we're all in the FBI, okay? And, and we've all seen those movies where um, they're drugged, the FBI agent's drugged, and then they're dropped off, you know, in a foreign country. So we're all drugged. We've all been dropped off in a foreign country. We have no idea where we are. So we're waking up, okay, we're in the middle of the road, and, you know, we're like, gosh, 
you know, where, where am I? I don't know what day it is. I don't know what time it is. I don't know where I am. I can hear people talking, but it's in a foreign language. You know, so you kind of look over here to the right, and, and there's someone over here going, get up. Get up. You're in the middle of the road. Get up, you know, and we're kind of like, oh, gosh, you know, so we look over here to the other side, and, and there's someone over here, and they're smiling at you, and they're like, here, let me help you, you know, and they're bending down to, to help you out of the road. You know, which side of the road are you going to go to? You know, I don't know about you, but I'm going over here, you know, to the person who's being nice to me. So your tone and, and it is so important, you know, when you're dealing with someone with Alzheimer's. And yet one of the hardest things, you know, to do all the time. But so speak calmly and end your sentences with something positive. So this is a pretty interesting one is when they say no, they mean no. You know, you are not, <laughs> you laugh, don't you? Because it's one of those things, you know, I used to keep two filing cabinets on my shoulder. And this one was, okay, I tried that and it worked, so I'm going to do it again. And this one was, never going to do that again. That was not the reaction I thought I was going to get. And so, um, but, but honestly, you know, when they say no, you know, they, they mean no. So what we learned in our experience is if you take the word you out of your vocabulary and add we into it, makes a big difference. For example, I said to my mom, um, why don't we go in the bathroom and brush our teeth? I'd go in the bathroom with her. I'd put toothpaste on her toothbrush, toothpaste on mine. You know, I'd hand it to her, and I would start brushing my teeth because if, you know, if I had just handed my mother her toothbrush and she was down in the valley, you know, she might have um, brushed her hair, you know, or, or, or done her eyebrows. It's interesting that they will mimic you for a long time. And so... Take you out of your vocabulary and add we. It just makes a big difference. You know, why don't we go to the restroom? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Nobody likes to be told what to do. You know, not even our dogs, you know, like us to tell them what to do. So no means no. If they tell you no and it's something that's important then, and, and I'm going to get to this in a few minutes, but then you have to redirect their thought process into something else and then come back. And you also have to determine, is it something that they have to do right now, you know? In this disease, you know, there are things that are hard and there are things that are impossible. And so a lot of times I would ask myself, is this hard or is this impossible? Most things are hard, but there are things that are impossible. So no means no. So the next one is, and this is something that we've all done, you know, and um, it's just something that once you realize that there is um, something going on, you know, in their head, then you have to take out of your vocabulary. Don't you remember? I just told you that. I mean, I did it. You know, my mom would say something to me, and she would repeat a question. I'd be like, Mom, don't you remember? I just told you that. But you have to take it out because what is their disability? Short term. <laughs> They're never going to remember it. And so it, it, it's really hard. And one of the things that I noticed with my mom is that, it, you know, it would hurt her feelings. You know, I'd see her drop her head, and I'd be like, oh, my gosh, I just hurt her feelings. So it's really hard. It's one of these things that we have to work at, you know, taking it out of our vocabulary. But, you know, you just can't correct them. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't matter. You know, with this disease, you, you pick your battles, you know, what's important and what's not. And they're going to say things and do things, and you just, you just really don't, don't correct them. Okay, the next one is you can't argue with them. <laughs> You're never going to win. I mean, you are never going to win an argument. And so, and, and to me, this is one of the hardest things, too. It's kind of like the, the correcting because we want things to be the way they were. You know, why, did, why does it have to change? And, you know, the, what's really hard with caregivers is, you know, we're always adapting our lifestyles to what's going on with the disease. You know, and so when they start doing things or they start arguing with you, especially when it's, well, you didn't tell me that. You know, and you're like, yes, I did tell you that. You know, that's, that's the most difficult, especially when it's a, um, y'all, you, you have discussed a decision that's important, and, and then they, they have no memory of it. But um, um, arguing with them is, you're, you're never going to win. The, the key here is always agree and then do what you were going to do anyway. You know, that's what we learned. And our, well, one of our little tricks. So um, this is a, of course, I'm always going, this is a biggie. But this is an important one, too, is you never really want to discuss anything negative. You know, you always want to be very matter-of-fact or positive because it's interesting. Our brains process things differently, positive things one way and negative things another. 
and my mother and my dad both would hang on to something negative. And I would think, how can they still remember that? They can't remember what they did 10 minutes ago, but yet they, they held on to, you know, something that I told them that was negative, especially if it has to do with a family member. And then, you know, this can get hard, too, as a disease progresses. It's difficult to put them in negative situations, you know, like a funeral. It's really hard. I've had several caregivers who've lost their spouse, and then... Um, you know, how do, they don't, because their disability is short-term memory loss, they don't remember that they died, you know, and then do you take them to the funeral or do you not take them to the funeral? You know, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made, but, the, you know, I think it all boils down to is what's best for that person, and a lot of times it's not going, because here's the thing, they're not going to remember it anyway. So putting them in a situation that's very stressful to them um, um, is hard, because, they tend to keep that stress, you know, because it's negative, you know, for a few days. And then you, you, you will not have the ability to come back and say, well, they died. We went to the funeral, you know, because they're never going to remember it. So you just can't, you just really can't discuss anything negative with them, if at all possible. So one of the things that on my very first day when I was back in Fayetteville and my sister was, had been kind of taking care of my mom and I'm, I'm in the car with her and I'm thinking, oh, this is great, I'm home, I've been gone for 20 years and, and at the bottom of our hill was a Taco Bell, a Sonic and a McDonald's and so a lot of our redirection tools. And so we were, we're there at lunch and, and um, I remember I was sitting in the back seat and I was, my sister Linda looked at my mom and she said, um, you know, BB, you love bean burritos here. And I remember thinking, that was brilliant because my mom couldn't read. You know, when we pulled up, I thought, can, can she read, you know, the, the board out there and, and kind of tell what she wants to eat? And, and so one of the things that's important, I think, is, is that you always give them an excuse. You know, um, anytime anybody approached my mom, I'd say, look, mom, there's your son, Jack, or there's your granddaughter, Molly, or, or you know, there's your friend, Rose. Every seat belt is different. Every button is different. You know, my mom always allowed us to say that. But I think when you go to a restaurant, what's so important with this disease is keeping their dignity. And so whenever we would go to a restaurant, you know, we would give my mom a menu. And she would sit there and she would read it just like everybody else. And then when, when it came time for her to order, you know, we would bend over and we'd say, you know, BB, this is what you love here. And she'd go, okay. Because you'll notice that when they get to a point when you ask them a question and they can't answer it, like, what do you want for dinner? You want steak or chicken? Oh, I don't know. What do you want? Then you know they can't answer questions. So don't ask them, <laughs> you know, because then that kind of puts them on a, on a, in a, in a stressful situation. At times, and a lot depends on the personality. But, you know, it's... You know, this is where, you know, the, the trial and error and, and things go on. But um, anyway, you want to always give them an excuse. I told my mom, and I'll get to this in, well, actually, I'll, I'll wait till I get to that point. But uh, especially when you go to a restaurant with Christmas coming up, anytime or Thanksgiving, anytime you're in a situation where there are crowds, it's really important to have one person with them all the time. And if there's a lot of family in, then, then maybe you can take shifts. But if you, you, you know, you, you need to, like if for uh, Thanksgiving, I would sit next to my mom and I'd say, Oh, Mom, it's, it's Thanksgiving. Isn't that great? Look, everybody's coming over. We're going to have lunch. It's, we're going to have such a great time. And, and then a few minutes would pass by, and I'd go, Hey, Mom, it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> everybody's coming over. We're going to have a great time. And as people would walk in, I'd go, Oh, look, there's your granddaughter, you know, Madison, or, or there's your grandson, Jake. And, and you just kind of help them because it's very stressful, and they work very hard. And as the disease progresses, it becomes harder and harder for them to process things and they wear out so if they get to a point where they just close their eyes like this and they'll say I'm just going to take a quick little nap what they're telling you is is I just can't process another thing you know I I'm tired and so that's okay you know let them do it or you can walk out of the room but if you leave them alone you know for very long and they're trying to handle what's really hard is multiple conversations you know I'm from a large family we all talk at the same time we have multiple you know I'm talking to this person but I also throw an answer over here you know because that's just the way we are and they just can't deal with that I mean, and so one of the things you'll notice, too, is they just won't say much of anything. They'll just sit back and smile and every now and then interject something. But during, during the holidays, it's just really important to have somebody with them. Okay. So home. 
This is an interesting one because they always will say, take me home. I want to go home. Please take me home. And the first time my mom said that, oh, wait a minute. What time was I supposed to go to? Oh, 1130, right? Okay. So, um, so my mom, you know, I would say, um, you know, she'd go, take me home. And I thought, what does she mean? Does she mean, because my parents lived in two houses in Fayetteville. I thought, does she mean her other house or is she thinking about when she grew up? But if you look at her eyes, what are the eyes going to tell you? She's frightened. You know, and so really when they say to you, um, take me home, really what they're saying is I'm looking for a safe place because, I, I, I'm, you know, they're in the valley. They're unsure of who they are, what they're supposed to be doing, and they don't understand their surroundings. So that's re really when you want to, you know, reassure her, you know, I, you know that, hey, BB, it's, it's Betsy, it's your daughter. I love you. You know, you're safe and I'm not going to leave you. Or two, I mean, again, those are really I important points. Um, but um, so an, uh, another interesting thing, too, is sometimes when you're driving them home, <laughs> you pull up in the house, and my mom would say, this is not my house. Well, you can't argue with her. You can't correct her, you know, and tell her, you know, that, yes, this is her house. So all you can do is I'd go, okay. <laughs> so we would pull out the driveway, go down the street. As I said, we had a Taco Bell, McDonald's. <laughs> And a, and a Sonic, and so we'd go, oh, let's go get a milkshake. And so we'd pull in there, we'd get a milkshake. I would redirect her thought process into anything. Now that we have phones, you can call someone and say, hey, come, st come outside, you know, we're, we're heading home. Or, you know, what we started doing is then we would talk about her house on the way up the hill. I'd say, Phoebe, we're going home. You have such a pretty yard. My mom loved to work in the yard. I'd say, you have the prettiest flowers in town. <gasps> Your puppies are going to be so excited to see you. And you start talking about where it is you're going. And then most of the time when we would do that, we would pull up and she would get out of the car. So, but when they say, that's not my house, that's not this, that, you know, then it's like no, no means no. You know, you, you can't argue, you can't correct them. You just have to pull, a, pull out. And so um, luckily what happens is they do things in phases. As soon as you figure out what it is they're doing, they change to something else. And so it, no matter what phase they're in, it's, it's, just, it's just temporary. So that, that's one blessing. Um, when they repeat a question, just know it's important to them. Um, right after my mom was diagnosed, my dad sent her to Houston for a week and and my daughter Molly, and my dad, I mean, and my husband collected carnival glass. And so we had this big, you know, piece that had all this carnival glass in it. And every time my mother's eyes got to it, she, you know, she, now she knew I was moving back, but she didn't understand why. And so she would say, are you going to have to um, pack that up? You know, and I'd say, oh, you know what, Mom, I'm so lucky. I've got people going to come in. They're going to pack everything up for me. And she'd go, oh, okay. And then, you know, we'd be over here, you know, watching Good Morning America or something. And then her eyes would go back over to that side of the room. And then she'd go, um, are you, are, are you going to have to pack that up? And, and, I mean, after she'd been there a week, she must have said it a hundred times. But I remember thinking, it's important to her. You know, so when they repeat a question, just know that it's very important to them. See, they, they get a thought in their head, and they ask you the question. And you answer it. But because their disability is short-term memory loss, they forget that you answered it. Well, the question is still here in their head, so they ask you again. You know, so um, that's when, you know, you just, it, when they get stuck on something, then you just have to redirect their thought process into something else. And again, you know, their likes, their dislikes, you know, what it is you can use to change that thought process. Sometimes I'd go, I'd clap my hands, I'd go, oh, BB, and just clapping my hands would startle her enough, and then I'd have just a few seconds, you know, to get in there, and I'd go, why don't we go get a milkshake? Or why don't we go get a chocolate chip cookie? My mom went from a size 4 to a 12 <laughs> while we were taking care of her because redirection into food was really easy. And so, I mean, she'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, let's go eat, you know. And so, um, anyway, um, so when they repeat a question, as hard as it can be, it can be frustrating. But I will tell you that those stories that they tell you over and over, you know, which also give you insight into where they are. So when you're sitting there and they tell you a story about where they lived and maybe it was in Chicago, you know, years and years ago, then that's when you tell yourself, okay, you know, they're traveling back in time. This is where they are. You know, so I'll give you a story on my dad. So one day I was taking him to the catfish hole because he loved catfish. And we were actually meeting some of his 
former players. And so I'd always prep him. Hey, Dad, we're going to Catfish Hole. And, and uh, you know what? I said, we're going to meet some of your players. And I said, you know what, Dad? Most of them are from the national championship team. And he looked at me and he said, did, did we win a national championship? And so now I understand, you know, that that means he's back past 1964. You know, when he, if he had said that to me, that if it was my first rodeo, that would I would have been like, yes, you know, it would have been devastating, you know, because that's something that took me, took me a long time to learn. But anyway, when they repeat a question, it's very important to them. So I got, okay, so I'll finish up with this one. I didn't get near as far as I planned to. Okay, well, I was 20 minutes short, that's why. Um, so... Okay, I'm going to, well, three minutes. Okay, so um, th this one is pretty interesting, I think, and that's what they see on TV is real. You know, my mom loved to watch, like, Law and Orders and things like that when we first started taking care of her, you know, but then th they would frighten her. And what's interesting is they will put themselves, they'll watch a TV show, and then they'll put, they'll take a part of that TV show and put it into a situation that they're in. And then they'll tell you, something that transpired that day, but it's a little bit of this show and maybe a, a little bit of this show. So you have to be really careful. Um, my mom, so actually, we watched musicals all the time. And um, it was, I mean, my kids were probably the only, you know, 13 and 14 year old who knew every word to The Sound of Music, My Fair Lady and The Music Man, you know, so she, she loved that. But what's in, so there's a gentleman named David that um, he was from Missouri that I talked to. He was one of my caregivers back then. And, and so he called me one day and he said, Betsy, I cannot get my wife. She keeps saying, where's my husband? And, and he said, you know, I keep going here. It's me. And she goes, you are not my husband. He said, so I took her in the bathroom, and I, you know, I put my arm around her, and I pointed into the mirror, and I said, look, honey, it's me. It's your husband. And she said, you are not my husband. And he said, well, who is that right there? And she said, well, that's that old woman I see every now and then. So you see, they don't recognize themselves. And when he said that to me, flash back to my mom, and I thought, you know, she always had a blank look, looking into the mirror. But she, I do hear a lot of funny stories about people that will walk by and go, hey, how are you doing? You know, <laughs> and they'll have a little bit of a conversation. But sometimes the mirror, that person in the mirror can frighten them. But see, they don't recognize themselves because they're traveling back in time. You know, and they, so they, um, that, that's just an old person to them. They have no idea. Isn't that interesting? They have no idea who that person is looking back at them. And I just thought, wow, that is just, it's just kind of mind-blowing. But uh, so you have to be careful what you watch on TV. And if the mirrors scare them, then you got to, you got to cover them up. So it's 1129, almost 1130. So we're, we're back on track. So we will come back after um, lunch. And, but if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'm happy to answer some questions right now. Um, or we can do it after the, the second session. Okay. Music is great. Music is one of the best things you can do, especially if you can play music back from when their childhood and growing up. My parents were born, you know, in, in the 20s, so we played big band music all the time. And it's very relaxing, and it's a, it's a good thing to do anytime you know that there's a, a stressful time, you know, like they do sundowning or have, a, like, a late afternoon behavior type issue. Um, sometimes bathing is a good thing. Now, I'm going to play three songs while we're taking the bath. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they listen, you know, to the, to the three songs. But I think music is, well, it's proven. It's one of the best things you can do. You can put headphones on, on individuals who haven't um, really talked in a long time or done much of anything, and they'll start, you know, tapping their foot, you know, tapping their hand. So really music is one of the most wonderful things that you can do. It's just relaxing. Mm -hmm. Takes them back to a time, you know, that's good. Are there any other questions? I said, Yes. We did. I said, you did. Yes, you did. And he was just like, I mean, he had no memory of it. Luckily, it didn't, it didn't, because we were in the car, and, and it wasn't like if we were at home, it might have been a different situation. But my dad didn't, neither one of my parents knew they had the disease. And so, because they had told my, my mother that she'd had a stroke and it affected her short-term memory, we didn't tell them. Um, I'm a believer that you don't have to tell them. You know, people are, it's one of the number one fears now is coming down with Alzheimer's. So if you don't have to tell them, um, my dad, so 
my mother, there's two types of people that, that have this disease. One is like my mother who they have insight into themselves for a long time. She knew there was something wrong and she asked me every day where my dad lost the insight into himself very early. So I'll give you an example on that from Dr. Linker. Um, He's a psychiatrist. He goes to the hospital and he sees a lot of patients. And so he's, you know, there's a, a man that had a stroke and he lost his left arm. And so he would hold up the arm like this in front of him and he would say, whose arm is this? And the gentleman would say, well, it's your arm. You see, they lose the insight into themselves. This happens with all people that have Alzheimer's. Sometimes I call it they don't know anymore that they don't know, and that's really when the, the care changes. But um, so my dad never understood that he had the disease. And so he, he only asked me twice through the whole process. He goes, do I have Alzheimer's? And I'd say, no, no. Because when he was diagnosed to begin with, um, you know, I told you when I was traveling with him that I kind of tricked him. He was turning 85, and I was like, oh, Dr. Linker, you're 85. You're in such great health. He wants to run a whole battery of tests, even an MRI. And he's like, okay. And I thought, wow, that was easy, <laughs> you know. And then, um, and so then when he, we, we did the cognitive test, um, the doctor came out and was like, you know, and I just cried. I was like, I'm leaving because he'll, he'll walk out and see me, and he'll know there's something, something wrong. And, but, um, so the first doctor diagnosed him with Alzheimer's, and then I had to tell him because I promised him when my mother was sick that, that I would tell him, well, he just got married, and he was devastated. And so um, um, then he was like, well, I, I, I'm going to go get a second opinion. So he went and got a second opinion, and they told him he had MCI because it was very early, you know. And, um, and so he could, he could grab a hold of that because only 50% of the people that have MCI, mild cognitive impairment, um, go into Alzheimer's, even though I, it may even be higher than that now. But um, so, he, you know, he, he could grab a hold of that. And then he just never really, you know, because we were, like Molly said earlier, you know, we understood the disease. We knew how to communicate. We knew what was coming. You know, he was a breeze compared to my mom. I mean, we, we had it down. We, we, we knew what to expect. We knew how to communicate. We knew how to redirect. We knew everything that we needed. So he never really knew. It was re very interesting. And I, I really thought in the beginning that he would be such an advocate for it, you know, that he would be like, I have the disease, you know, but it was the opposite. He just never saw it at all. So, therefore, uh, you know, we just never discussed it. And, again, I don't necessarily think you have to, you know, because generally they've had, you know, a stroke or a seizure or some kind of procedure relating to anesthesia, which is huge. And, you know, if you don't ever have to go under anesthesia, don't. You know, get a block if it's a shoulder replacement or a knee or a hip. Do not go under anesthesia. And so you can always come up with a reason, just like with my mom, when she'd say, what's wrong with me? You know, I'd say, well, BB, you had a stroke, and it affected your short-term memory. That's why we're here. You know, isn't it great that we get to be together? And, and, um, and I'd say, but, you know, you're beautiful, and, and you're smart, and, you know, life could be so much worse. So anyway, I've gone past my time. <laughs> <laughs> Molly's looking at me like, wrap it up. So anyway, y'all go to lunch, and we will, we're going to do a couple things, and then we will um, have lunch, and then we'll be back here at 1230, or quarter to one.